We live, we love, we serve. Well, we are blessed tonight. A very first time here at FCBC, Reverend Maria Crompton. Come on, y'all got to give it up. A gifted preacher, teacher, dynamic pastor. She is a senior pastor of the Elmwood United Presbyterian Church in East Orange, New Jersey. I am grateful that she accepted this invitation. I am in anticipation of a word from God. She's a graduate of Drew University and Princeton Theological Seminary, but more than that, she is a true, true daughter, pastor, leader of God. And we thank God for her. Thank God for some of her folk who are here tonight. Amen. Made sure she wasn't going to be by herself. Listen, FCBC, do me a favor. Extend your hand in the direction of Pastor Maria. Just repeat after me. God bless. Pastor Maria. God touch. Pastor Maria. God touch me that I might receive a word from you. Amen. After selection from our worship team, the next voice you will hear is our preacher for this first night of the rock revival. Reverend Maria Crompton, the Elmwood United Presbyterian Church. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. FCBC, go ahead and put your hands together. Give God some praise all over the building. We thank God today for the change that has come over us. Oh, hallelujah. Is there anybody in the house today who can say, I'm glad to be in the number one more time? Is there anybody who can look back over the day, look back over the week, look back over the month, look back over the year and say, I am so glad that God kept me. I am so glad that God kept his hand on me. I'm so glad that I'm here today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You all may be seated in the presence of God. I'ma try not to be before you long. But while I'm here, I want to show up strong. Amen. Amen. We thank God for the spirit of God that is already moving in this place. We thank God for your pastor. Can you help me celebrate Pastor Mike this evening? Yes. Honor your pastor. Love on your pastor. He has been such a blessing to me, so supportive of me. He's come to Elmwood, he's preached at the wood, and I am just so grateful, so grateful that God allowed our paths to cross. To Pastor Lakeisha, whom I just met for the first time today. Yes, yes. FCBC, do you know how blessed you are? You got one but, but two powerhouses, and that is a blessing. I just met her for the first time today, but I have been watching and admiring her from afar for quite some time. I thank God just for the, the spirit of hospitality that is in this place I felt, the, I felt the spirit of hospitality uh, from the moment uh, pastor's assistant Sharon contacted my assistant. It was just a connection right there. I just knew from the security team to the deacons that met me in the office to this amazing worship team, this band. the pastors and ministers, all of you who are gathered, those who are streaming, um, and of course, last but certainly not least, there are some folks who drove here in the rain and the snow all the way from East Orange, New Jersey. Elmwood is in the building, yes. You know what, Pastor Mike, I think, I think they might keep me around. They, they done came out in the snow and rain and 
They are so supportive. I am grateful. I'm grateful for my squad. Amen. FCBC, your spring revival falls right at the intersection of Women's History Month and the Lenten season. So while we are celebrating and elevating the lives of women, we are simultaneously journeying with Jesus to the cross. I find that to be so fitting, Pastor Lakeisha, uh, because if there were ever a time for women to be celebrated, for women to be elevated, it should be during Lent. It should be during the 40-day period when we are intentional about walking with Jesus because Jesus was intentional about celebrating and elevating the lives of women. Women's history or her story is all about telling the stories that have been left out of his story. Even in the church. Even in the church, women's stories have not historically been told. Or if women's stories are told, it's the same women and the same stories. How many, the church has been so selective about which women's stories get taught and preached and which stories are not. How many times are we going to hear a sermon about the woman caught in adultery? How many times are we going to hear the story about the woman with the issue of blood? There are so many other women in scripture who have made significant contributions to our faith, whose names are never mentioned, whose stories are never preached from the pulpit, and whose lives are never taught in Sunday school. So tonight, in honor of Lent, and in celebration of Women's History Month, I feel called to share the story of a woman whose name we may not know, but whose life matters. And I believe that she has something to teach us tonight. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, please stand for the reading of the word. We find her story and media team, I may skip around a little bit, but listen to this woman's story. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but were the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make expiation? that you may bless the heritage of the Lord. The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us in Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, what do you say that I should do for you? They said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. Verse eight, the king took the two sons of Rizpah, 
daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, Armani and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merib, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of the harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come to the bodies by day or wild animals by night. When David heard what was told, what Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Sham. Verse 13, he brought them up from there, the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and gathered the bones of those who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul, of his son Jonathan, in the land of Benjamin and Zelah, in the tomb of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you remain standing as we pray? God, we thank you for this preaching moment. We thank you, oh God, because this is our opportunity to hear from you. God, there are some folks who pressed their way out tonight because they want to know what does God have to say about what I'm going through? God, I'm asking tonight that you speak. Speak to me, speak through me as I attempt to speak for you. Move me out the way, oh God. Take control of this moment. God, if I'm not getting it, oh God, go ahead and move me and speak the word that your people need to hear. Have your way in this place tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself. From the beginning of harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens, she did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. FCBC, I, I want to preach tonight from the thought, I'm with her. I'm with her. Before the mother of Emmett Till stood over the casket that contained the disfigured body of her baby boy, there was Rizpah. Before the mothers of Amadou Diallo and Sean Bell had to identify the bodies of their sons who were murdered by law enforcement, there was Rizpah. Before the mothers of Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, and Breonna Taylor had to grieve the fact that their children were killed before their time, there was Rizpa. Before the mother of Eric Gardner heard, I can't breathe, or the mother of Tyree Nichols heard the cries of her son screaming in the night, Mom, Mom, there was Rizpa. Even before Mary, the mother of Jesus, stood at the foot of the cross and watched her son be sacrificed to state-sanctioned brutality, there was Rizpah. 
Before there was an anti-lynching movement, before there was a civil rights movement, before there was a Black Lives Matter movement, there was Rizpa, the mother of Armoni and Mephibosheth, who also stood over the bodies of her disfigured sons, who also had to identify the bodies of her boys who were killed by law enforcement, who also had to grieve the fact that her children were killed before their time, who also heard the screams of her baby boys, who also watched her sons be sacrificed to state-sanctioned brutality. Rizpa. At some point, we have all heard the names Mamie Tell, Mobley, Sabrina Fulton, Gwen Carr, but most of us had not heard the name Rizpa before tonight. Unlike Esther and Ruth, the only two women in scripture who have books bearing their name, whole books that tell their story, Rizpa is only mentioned twice in the sacred text. And you know what, family? In both places, Rizpa does not speak. Rizpa has no words. But listen, just because she is silent doesn't mean she has to be silenced. Because tonight, we will give her voice. Rizpah first appears in scripture in the, second, uh, in the second book of Samuel, chapter 3. And there are some things that we learn in that text that will provide some context for our text tonight. Can we take a moment just to kind of build this thing up? Is that all right? So, 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 so we're going to go back to, to that third chapter of 2 Samuel, and here is what we learn. First, we learn that Rizpah is the concubine of King Saul. Now, there is some dispute and some debate around whether uh, Rizpah was a concubine or if she was a wife, but, but I believe that most scholars agree that she was a secondary wife or a low-class, low-status wife, which simply means that Rizpah was was required to perform all of the roles and all of the responsibilities of a full wife, but she was not afforded the position or the privileges of the primary wife. Now, I'm sure there's a word in there for somebody, but I'm going to go ahead and mind my business because uh, that's between you and the Lord. I'm just I'm just, I'm just stopping by tonight. I don't want to get in anybody's business, Pastor Mike. I ain't trying to mess up nobody's situationship. I, I'm just going to preach my little message and head back, back to New Jersey. So, so, so we know that Rizpa was just a, a, a low class, a low status wife. The second thing we learn is that Saul dies. While he was alive, the situation ship between Saul and Rizpah was working, but when he is gone, Rizpah is left without the protection of a husband, without the privileges of being a primary wife. Her name wasn't on the insurance, y'all. And now she is in a position where she must parent her two boys all by herself. Rizpah is left in a dangerously vulnerable position. The third thing we learn is that a man by the name of Abner, listen, we're going to call out all the atrocities in scripture. That's just, that's just the kind of preacher I am. I hope I don't offend anybody, but I call it out. I name it because we have to name it. If we can't name it in scripture, how are we going to name it in our own lives? So, 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 so let me, I, don't, I, don't, I just want to make sure y'all understand where I'm coming from. So, so, so then there was a man by the name of Abner, Saul's former commander in chief his boy, right? Abner, when he finds out that, that Rizpah is all alone, he prays. P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y. <laughs> on Rizpah's vulnerability. And the text tells us that he rapes Rizpah. 
Now the rape was a power move for Abner. It was politically motivated because there were political implications for impregnating the wife, even the low class wife of a king. This family is our introduction to Rizpah. She was the low status wife of a king with no position, no power, no privileges, who became a widow and a single parent of two boys, and now she is the victim of sexual assault. This is the context that we bring to our text tonight. Our text opens with, king, with David as king. Saul is dead and David is the king of Judah. Now this, is, this was a long time coming for David. If you know anything about the story of David, David waited 15 years to become king. There were 15 years that fell in between the time David was anointed king and when he was appointed king. 15 years. Some of y'all can't wait 15 minutes to find out if you got the position, if you got the promotion. But David had to wait 15 years. And you know what that proves? That proves that destiny can be delayed, but it can never be denied. David has stepped into his destiny as king when we get to our text. And what we learn is that David is dealing with a crisis. Somebody say crisis. Now, now let me tell you something about this crisis because it wasn't David's crisis. This was a crisis that David inherited from his predecessor, Saul. How many of you know that there is nothing more dreadful, nothing more draining, pastor, for a new leader than having to deal with an inherited crisis? When you are a new leader trying to fix an old problem, it is the worst. But here is where we find David. We find David, this new king, this new leader, who is dealing with this crisis that he inherited from Saul. The text says that for three years, there was a famine in the land. A famine that for three years impacted every aspect of the people's lives. For three years, the people did not have access to safe drinking water. Because of this crisis, there were supply chain issues. Families were unable to access food and the other supplies they needed to survive. For three years, the people experienced inflation, starvation, malnutrition, sickness, disease, high death rates. I know you all think I left scripture and I came and started talking about what's happening in 2023, but I promise I'm still in the Bible. I'm, I'm still talking about the famine that David was facing 3,000 years ago, I promise. The same way the global pandemic has impacted every aspect of our lives, the famine impacted the lives of the people living in David's day. And so David, this new leader, this new king, anxious and excited about stepping into his destiny, he just wants the famine to be over so that he can start to lead. <laughs> so, so here's what he does. He, he goes and he inquires of the Lord. He goes to God and he said, God, why is this happening? The Lord responds. The Lord responds and, and, and reveals to David that the famine was punishment for killings committed by Saul while he was king. You see, while in office, Saul made an oath to the Gibeonites who were one of the indigenous groups that lived in the land of Canaan before the children of Israel entered the promised land. You know, they didn't discover the promised land, right? They didn't discover there were already people there when the Israelites got there, but they discovered it was their land. They just, okay, that's a whole nother sermon. 
So, so, so the Gibeonites, they were, they were one of the indigenous people who were already in the land of Canaan. Saul promised to preserve and protect them. But instead of preserving their culture and protecting their lives, he tried to annihilate them. Attempted genocide. Saul deliberately and systematically tried to eradicate an entire ethnic group and the famine that David is experiencing is God's punishment. Y'all with me? Now I want to pause parenthetically just to emphasize that Saul is gone. He's gone. But three years later, there is a new leader in office who now has to deal with the aftermath of the poor decisions that Saul made while he was in office. You see, because Saul did not properly manage this crisis, Biden, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, David, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because Saul did not properly manage this crisis, David is paying the price, and the people are now living with the consequences of Saul's bad decisions. Now that David understands why the famine is happening, the text says that he tries to deal with it. He's a new leader, he's anxious, he just wants this problem to be over, right? The text says that he calls a meeting with the Gibeonites to ask them how he could atone for the sins of Saul. Remember, David, desperate for the famine to be over, desperate. The Gibeonites, the indigenous people, are hurting, they're grieving, they're angry, and rightfully so. They respond to David by saying, if you want to make this right, we don't want your silver, we don't want your gold, you can't buy our silence. If you want to make this right, give us seven of Saul's descendants so that we may impale them before for the Lord. Now let's do a little bit of work right here because the Hebrew word translated as impale can also be translated as hang. This sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Family, we know something about public hangings. We know something about the public lynchings of innocent bodies, don't we? The Gibeonites want to hang Saul's descendants, innocent children, because they claim this is the only way to atone for the sins of Saul. Now, this request is bad, but the response is worse. David, King David, Shepherd David, Harpist David, the, the, the author of the Psalms, David, without hesitation, without reservation, Pastor Lakeisha, without any, any attempt of at negotiation, agrees to hand over five of Saul's grandchildren and two of Rispa's sons to be executed. Now, as I read and reread this text, trying to make it make sense, I had some questions. I hope you have some questions too. Maybe I can ask your questions, right? So my first question, my first question was why didn't David counter offer? Handing over innocent children to be killed could not have been the only way. There had to be some other options, some, some other alternatives. Uh, my second question is, why didn't David go back to God? Yeah. 
He consulted God in the beginning of the text. Why not go back to God and ask God how he should proceed? Instead of providing a counter offer, instead of going back to God to get some guidance and some direction, David just accepted the first offer from the Gibeonites and didn't even try to protect the lives of these innocent children. Church, I kept reading and rereading this text because I just knew that I had to be missing something. This was David, wasn't it? Shepherd David. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, so, so I, I must have been missing something, but as I read and reread the text, it dawned on me. David doesn't want to save the lives of Saul's descendants. It, saving Saul's descendants would not be in David's best interest. You see, at any point, any one of Saul's heirs could challenge David for the throne. David knows that as long as Saul's descendants are alive, he will always have to be looking over his shoulder. Because at any point, Saul's descendants could come and claim the throne. David does nothing to fight for the lives of those innocent boys because they're a threat to him. He sanctions their execution because he wants to protect his power, his position, his privilege. I know, I know, I know. I know, I know, we're talking about our beloved David. I know, I know, somebody mad with me right now. Somebody is hot with me right now because we're talking about David, the one who is described as a man after God's own heart. But let me tell you in this text, somebody say this text. God is not in this at all. David is not acting on behalf of God. David is acting out of his own ego. And instead of protecting those boys, he is more concerned about protecting his power. To add insult to injury, after the boys were executed, David refused to give them a proper burial. According to, to Hebraic law, burial was a sacred rite, and human bodies, even the bodies of enemies, were to be treated with dignity and given a proper burial. Instead, the bodies of the seven boys who were executed were left hanging on the mountain of the Lord. Another strategic move by David. You see, the same way slave owners would leave the dead, decaying bodies of those who had been lynched, hanging for days as a scare tactic, as a way to intimidate other slaves, David left those bodies hanging as a warning to any of Saul's living family members who may try to challenge his kingship. This was David's way of saying to Saul's family, don't come for me unless I send for you. Even in death, David tries to use these boys' bodies to solidify his power. But Rizpah, somebody say Rizpah. Rizpah is not having it up in here. You see, up until now, Rizpah has been a silent character in the text. But now, she makes her presence known. 
as Rizpa struggles to come to terms with the unjust killings of her sons, the Bible says that she makes her way to the mountain of the Lord where her baby's bodies are hanging. And Rizpa does for them in death what she could not do for them in life. She protects her baby's bodies. She couldn't protect them while they were alive. But in death, Rizba has made it up in her mind that she is going to protect the bodies of her sons. The Bible says that from the beginning of the harvest to the rain poured down from the heavens about six months, Rispa stayed on the mountain of the Lord, protecting her baby's bodies. She went to the place where their bodies were exposed, and every morning she would fight off the vultures. Every morning she would prevent the birds from tearing the eyes out of their bodies. Every evening, Rispa would drive away the wolves and the night predators who came to prey on her bodies. Can't you see it? Anybody can use their sanctified imagination. Can you see this woman running off the vultures, scaring away the birds, fighting off the wolves and the night prowlers, protecting her babies for six months. Somebody say Rizpa. It's amazing to me because when we preach the story about David, the shepherd boy, we glorify the fact that when he was a shepherd, he would fight off the bears and the lions in order to protect his sheep. But look at Rizpa putting her body on the line, fighting off the vultures and the wolves, preventing the predators from preying on the bodies of her babies. Look at Rizpa. David was supposed to be this shepherd king who was going to protect his people. And in this text, he gives up his, these boys to be killed. He's not protecting them, but Rizpa said, not on my watch. So FCBC, what can we learn from the story of Rizpa today? What can we learn from this woman who up until now has been a silent character in a story about the decisions of powerful men? Although we never get to hear Rizpa's voice in the text, through her actions, Rispa is speaking to us today. Can you hear it? I hear it. And let me tell you what I hear Rispa saying to us tonight. For those of us who may be struggling tonight, Rispa says, our strength is in the Lord. That's the first thing Rizba teaches us. Our strength is in the Lord. As Rizpa struggles to come to terms with the death of her baby boys, she has no place to go, no one to turn to for support. After all, she was just a low-class wife, a widow, a single parent, a victim of sexual assault. She had no power, no position, no privilege. Everyone had written her off, and I would argue that by not giving her a voice, they even try to write her out of God's story. Powerful men had taken everything from Rizpah. They took her voice, her security, her body, her children. They took everything and left her with nothing. But the text tells us 
that when Rispa had nowhere to go, husband gone, son's gone, no protection, no privilege, no power, she had nothing. When she had nothing and nowhere to go, the Bible says that Rispa made her way to the mountain of the Lord. When she didn't know what else to do, she climbed the mountain of the Lord. When it felt like she was out of options, she planted herself on the mountain of the Lord. And she refused to come down until the Lord responded. Rispa, this woman who had been silent found her strength on the mountain of the Lord. This woman who had been passive found her voice on the mountain of the Lord. This woman who was powerless found her power on the mountain of the Lord. This woman who had been a victim found her victory on the mountain of the Lord. And so for those of us who are struggling tonight, those of us who are stuck in out of options, for those of us who feel like life has left us with no place to go, Rispa teaches us that there is a place that we can go. We can climb the mountain of the Lord. We can plant ourselves in the presence of the Lord. And we can refuse to come down until the Lord responds. Is there anybody in the house today who can say, when I don't know where else to go, I can go to the presence of the Lord? Is there anybody who has ever been so down, so desperate, that they had to plant themselves in the presence of the Lord, and they made it up in their minds, I'm not going to move, I'm not going to get up, I'm not going to change my position until the Lord responds. Rizpah goes up on the mountain of the Lord and she said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay right here until the Lord responds. Some of us are trying to figure out why don't I have the answer to my prayer. You got up too soon. You got up too soon. Sometimes you got to plant yourself in his presence. You've got to make it up in your mind. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to get up until the Lord responds. If this is you, just go on, go on. Climb back up that mountain. Sit yourself down and wait until God responds. That's what we learned from Rizpah today. Rizpah says, listen, I don't understand what happened. I don't understand why I lost my boys. I don't understand why David did this. I don't understand why my babies had to die. But listen, I know who knows. I know who understands. I'm going to go to the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to stay right here until God responds. Go on back up the mountain and sit yourself down. Don't you get up until the Lord responds. Not only does Rizpah say to us tonight, our strength is in the Lord. She also says to us, stand in your truth. Stand in your truth. Everyone who passed the mountain of the Lord must have thought that Rizpah had lost her mind. First of all, she is standing on the mountain alone. No one is standing with her. It was dangerous. Who's going to go up against the king? 
No one is coming to stand with Rizpah. There was no Al Sharpton, no attorney Ben Crump, no protesters. Nobody is coming to stand with Rizpah. No one is going to the mountain to help her. She is all by herself with her dead, decaying bodies of her two sons and the five sons of Mered. Let me just pause and just let me just go ahead and, 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 and just say that I love the fact that Rispa doesn't just fight for her boys. She is on the mountain fighting for all the boys who were unjustly murdered. At this point, it's been six months and Rispa is still on the mountain. People are trying to get on with their lives, y'all. <clears throat> People are trying to get past all these killings. They're trying to move on with their lives. GMA has, keeps running the story over and over. People just want to get to the Oscars coverage. Right? They, they just want to push past all this noise about this, these killings, but they can't because every morning they can hear Rispa on the mountain. Shoo, shoo. Get out of here. Every time they pass the mountain, they can see Rispa fighting off the birds and the vultures. They're trying to move on with their lives, but every night they are awakened by the sound of Rispa yelling at the night prowlers, go away, go on, get out of here. Rispa's protest is becoming an inconvenience. Her protest is an interruption to the regularly scheduled program. With all that yelling from the mountain, people were forced to turn and look. With all that fighting happening on the mountain, people couldn't just sweep it under the rug. With all that activity on the mountain, people couldn't go on business as usual. Because of her protest, people could not look away. Rispa stands in her truth and refuses to allow the people to turn away from the violence that was inflicted upon her babies. As I think about Rispa forcing people to look at the decaying bodies of her sons, I am reminded of Mamie Tell Mobley. After her son Emmett was tortured and brutally murdered by white supremacists, everyone encouraged her to have a closed casket. But she said, and I quote, I want the world to see what they did to my baby. Mamie allowed the world to see the disfigured body of her son because she recognized that his death was bigger than him, bigger than her. Mamie's decision to let the world see her son was about exposing a system of injustice. Rispa stayed on the mountain. Rispa fought on the mountain. Rispa protested on the mountain and her resistance was bigger than her. She wanted to expose David, expose the system that killed her babies. Rispa teaches us tonight that we must stand in our truth. Even when people call us crazy, stand in your truth. Even when they call you a liar, you stand in your truth. Even when people try to write you off, you stand in your truth. Even when they tell you you're overreacting, you stand in your truth. Even when they tell you to sit down, and shut up you stand in your truth because standing in your truth is bigger than you
People don't want us to stand in our truth because when we stand in our truth, it exposes their lies. So when folks tell you you're overreacting, when they tell you to sit down, when they tell you to shut up, you remember Rizpah, remember her resistance, and you stand in your truth. Rizpah is silent in the text, but her story speaks to us tonight. It says, our strength is in the Lord. It says, stand in your truth. And one more thing and then I'm done, I promise. What Rizpah's story says to us today is that God is on our side. That's what her story says to us. God is on our side. The people watching Rizpah every morning, every night, may have thought that Rizpah was alone, but Rizpah was never alone, never alone, never alone. God was with her. Although David is positioned as the main character in this text, although David was the one with the power and the privilege and the prestige, God was not with David. God was with Rizpah. God was not with the monarch. God was on the mountain. God was not in the palace. God was in the protest. Now ask me how I know. Say, preacher, how do you know? It's in the text. It's in the text. Rizpah's protest on the mountain exposed David. You see, what happened was she was up there and she was protesting and she was fighting and, and she was shooing and she was making a whole lot of noise and, and people couldn't sleep and people couldn't eat and people couldn't go on with their lives and every time she would shoo and every time she would move, folks were forced to look up and people just started talking. Talking about how David was no better than his predecessor. Talking about how David was, was condemning Saul for killing the Gibeonites, but look, David killed innocent boys. People started talking, and when David realized that Rizpah's protest was on the verge of tarnishing his reputation and dismantling the legitimacy of his kingship, the text says that he made his way to the mountain of the Lord. Let me just pause parenthetically just to go ahead and let you all know that your protest, when you stand in your truth, the people in the highest positions will have to come down to you. David wasn't thinking about the mountain of the Lord. David, David had moved on and he was trying to figure out how he was going to lead these people. But a woman by the name of Rizpah started making some noise on a mountain and David had no choice but to come down and see about Rizpah. David made his way to the mountain of the Lord. And the text says that David took down the bodies of those who were executed and gave them a proper burial. And the word says that it wasn't until after that that God heeded the supplications for the land. What am I trying to say? David had prayed for the end of the famine, but God did not respond to David's request until he did what was right by Rizpah. God was on her side. Somebody say God was with her. Listen, listen, listen. I'm I'm on my way back to New Jersey, 
But listen, I just came to let you know that God was with her. But that shouldn't surprise us because God is always on the side of the oppressed. Always on the side of the marginalized, the disenfranchised. God is always on the side of the powerless, the voiceless, the defenseless, the helpless. God is always on the side of the low status, the lost, the less, the left out the least of these God is always on the side of the oppressed and let me tell you I want to be where God is I want to be with God where God is and so if God is with her then we ought to declare I'm with her We can't go back and stand with Rizpah, but let me tell you what you can do. You can stand with all of the Rizpahs of today. You can stand with the victims of sexual assault today. You can stand with the widows. You can stand with the powerless and the voiceless. You can stand with those who had been marginalized, disenfranchised, and pushed to the side. There's nothing that we can go back and do to change this narrative, but we can change the narrative right now. We can, we can can go and stand with the Rizpahs of today. And FCBC, listen, if God is with Rizpah, that's where I want to be. Somebody say, I'm with her. God bless you. What's up, FCBC? Pastor Trey here. Listen, thank you for watching, but don't stop just there. Be sure to like and subscribe at FCBC NYC. You'll get updates on sermons, announcements, and anything else that you might be interested in. But don't forget, you got to subscribe at FCBC NYC. Thank you.